This episode is sponsored by Fire and Fuel Coaching, where I help you discover who you are and where you want to go, both on and off the job. For more information, please reach out to me at my Instagram handle at Jerry Fire and Fuel. Welcome to episode 12 of Enduring the Badge podcast. I'm your host, Jerry Dean Lund, and today my very special guest is Jeff Frankham. He moved from firefighter, paramedic, captain, to now emergency manager. Listen to how he makes that shift after 15 years into emergency management. Also, I want to make a special note. This was recorded just one day before the mass shootings in El Paso, Texas, and in Dayton, Ohio. Jeff does make some references about being prepared for things like this, and I just want to make a little pause. You know, it's just a very difficult time for both the families and the first responders that had to go through this. So let's just jump right in with Jeff. You're not as hands-on as he used to be. Right. You know, not kind of. I mean, we had the opportunity to, as an emergency manager, especially being on, on an Army depot, you know, dealing with weapons of mass destructions, we had to go and do a lot with the communities, teach them about our... Uh, processes make sure we were doing what needed to be done we took part of in the local you know emergency the lapcs local emergency planning committees and stuff and we were able to give back we we did quite a bit with the communities but not not serving in the capacity you do as a firefighter so so did you grow up in utah provo provo yeah with you oh yeah (laughs) (laughs) just 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 checking to see exactly yeah i forgot about where i grew up yeah so i grew up in provo i've been a utah boy for too damn long yeah so yeah maybe We've been here a while might change that sometime no probably not no no, no. i utah, tried didn't work utah's out. a beautiful place to live if you those it who is. join us they haven't been here yeah it is man it's it's pretty amazing with just within a few hours yeah. from this area that we live in just in, outside of salt lake city you can be in some amazing beautiful places there is the mountains are beautiful that's good so that's you wanted good. to become a first responder when you were younger or how'd you um you know you come to that I was, we, where I grew up, we overlooked the main highway. And I was about 14 years old, and I saw a rollover, and I ran down. And my first experience was that there was a 10-year-old that got ejected, and he actually died in my arms. And I felt pretty helpless, you know, being one of the first down there. I was 14, 15 years old. And I, it just hit me, you know. I, I remember holding this kid and, and just watching life leave him, and I just felt helpless, you know. And so that was kind of a driver. That That was legitimately where the desire to start helping, yeah. you know, came from and just having the knowledge, you know, back when, back when we went to school, uh, they didn't offer the EMT courses until <laughs> no, we, no. right? No, right? Until we got out. Yeah. So there was no way to move forward with what I wanted to do. You know, it wasn't until after graduating and, uh, just again, seeking out that knowledge, you know, I mean, and uh, of what I could do with medicine and fire, you know, I looked at both the RN thing or and PA, you know, profession as well. And honestly, firefighting just, again, there were so many options to do as yeah. a firefighter paramedic. So those other routes, I mean, they have their diversities too, but they do. this is being a firefighter paramedic, you know, it's you just, right. It's a different thrill, right? So you're in the action instead of post action. Right. Right. Yeah, I mean, still, you know, ER departments and things like that, and surgery. They all have their, I guess, their their they, things that are that are fun and exciting to be involved in. Yeah. So your first job was uh, here locally, right? Mm, Geneva. Geneva. Dude, we're, you're aging. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Geneva was a yeah. training ground. Yeah. I mean, that's where you know I started. Geneva off, still. Yeah, Geneva still. Uh, I started off there. Um, you know, I. Uh, was able to work in just as an EMT, you know, firefighter EMT. There was some great, great training. We had the opportunity down there um, to train with Orem City all the time. And so, yeah. you know, they met some great guys. And, in fact, uh, you know, they, they did a lot with being able to, um, with classes, with courses as well. They were, they were able to train me in hazmat operations and fire too. And so we had some good perks working at Geneva. And Geneva yeah. was a great, great place to start. You yeah. Know? And so... That place, so a little bit of history about that. It's no longer existent. Right. It was one of the largest steel manufacturer companies in, I believe, in the world. Yeah. And now it's just 
non-existent. Right. Now it's yeah. a movie theater. Yeah. Yeah. Now, they, now they've leveled it and <laughs> covering up all the toxicness out there right. and uh, making right. it into homes and, yeah, right. movie theater and stuff now. Right. So I know a funny story about Geneva, and I don't know if you were <laughs> there for it, but I do know uh, one of the guys I used to work with. Can uh, we drop names on this? No. Oh, right. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you can. Probably, probably, probably not, not listening, but... Um, so other people might be, <laughs> <laughs> so I won't embarrass him. Right. Um, so they got a fire alarm on the at Geneva, and it actually w- it was a, a, some sort of actual fire. So right. it came in as alarm, and then they confirmed it was actual fire. But they uh, couldn't get the doors open to the fire oh, station. Heavens. I know this story. Yeah. Oh Didn't yeah. Then they just drive right through the yeah. fire the door. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He did. Yeah. In fact, that happened, and I wasn't on duty. <laughs> we can't drop that name. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> he's a good guy. Yeah. He did what he had to do. Right. Just straight up honest. I mean, it was a grease fire from what I recall. And uh, the power had gone out. And so he took the truck right through the <laughs> bay door and took the door with him. <laughs> so, so some yeah. other options hey. might have been to pull that cord up on top yeah, and push it up. Yeah, that's tall, though. That's a 30-foot yeah. ceiling. Yeah. I mean, he, yeah, there's other options. <laughs> <laughs> How did you hear that story? Yeah. Oh, that's was, a good story. There's good is, stories from Geneva. Yeah. We just don't talk about them. Yeah. So, but it was a good training ground. It really was, you know, and so. Yeah, especially when you get training like that to drive, <laughs> drive through, uh, yeah. through doors. That's, I don't think that's, he got his ADO right <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, Kind of explain your life a little bit as going back as let's take it into two two parts here. Kay. Explain your life kind of as being the firefighter paramedic, and then then we'll go on and we'll talk about you know your emergency management okay. portion. But um, again, you know, I started out at Geneva. Still, you know, it was it was like as we said, a steel plant, and I quickly worked myself up to captain. I think I was there. In fact, I I shut help. I was like the one of the fourth on the fire department to um, walk out of that place, you know? So yeah. when they, when they closed it down, but um, you know, from there, I just, you know, was able to go work for American Fork city volunteer and help work their program up to going full time. And then I came out, you know, to Eagle mountain, which is when we, you know, started working together with Saratoga because we worked a lot of mutual aid together right. and stuff. And, and in between that transition, um, I worked for, as a federal contractor, as a paramedic for the federal government, you know, for what was the EG&G and then went to URS Federal Services. And so we were always, I was always working two jobs. Yeah. But, you know, I, I was able to uh, be a captain in American Fork. I was able to be a captain in Eagle Mountain. And I just, you know, I mean, we went on, we went on a lot of calls. We went on a lot of calls, you know. And yeah. I, I, in American Fork City, I was averaging 680 calls a year and yeah it was just crazy between inner facility transports and we had a lot of stuff off i-15 you know in a naf and so we uh i was always driven medical you know i, I and and you'll i think you understand this you have your your heavy rescue guys you have your engineers and then yeah. you have your medical yeah you know and i <sighs> Firefighting was easy. Anybody can grab a hose and <laughs> put water on the hot stuff, right? Uh, That's well, why I, was I, would, I don't oh, know whatever, about that. Whatever. But. <laughs> Come on. I've been in a long time. But honestly, I, I, I enjoyed the medical aspect a lot yeah. more. Um, I just, again, it, and it's not, you know, a lot of people think that we get pushed by adrenaline. You know, when you yeah. first start, it's just, you can say there's adrenaline. Right. right. But I'll tell you, the, it, the desire to uh, be able to help others you know to be able to show up and and be the one that's there at that door when they hand you that kid yeah there's there's not a better feeling than that you know when you know that you can help that kid or you can help that parent that adult and so the medical uh there we're, we're back yeah. Yeah, we paused for a minute on IG. Uh, we're back now commercial break yeah but we uh you know as a paramedic that's why i was driven to go so much further on the medical side and that's and that's what i enjoyed the most so, so you're just saying it was more meaning meaningful for you to right the the paramedicine right. than actual right the firefighting well, you figure what we had at least 80 percent medicals so, yeah you know fires are always put out now because they're such good fire suppression <laughs> systems it's like you don't even get to play anymore. yeah so yeah it's yeah it just know? depends where you live in the country and the right. the, the trends of how old things right. are and Right. Yeah, but fire suppression suppression systems do help quite a bit now. They do. So, with the paramedicine, I mean, that comes some with some heavy weight of calls at times. 
Yeah, it does a lot. There's, there's, there's still calls that hit me. You know, I mean, there's from, you know, pediatrics to not so much adults, more pediatrics than anything. Yeah. You know, um, that that weigh on you. But you know, I, I, again, with the training and, and good crews, you know, you get through. There's some good good things to help. You know, deal with that. But there's. There's there are calls. I mean, there's people's names I'll never forget, and yeah. calls that you go on that you just don't ever forget. Close your eyes, you can see that face and see the situation they were in. So, do you have a way of dealing with that? Um, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I it it was hard. You know, we I went on. There was one little gal who got backed over. You know, and I I won't tell the full story, but she got backed over by a suburban while she was on her bike. Yeah. And uh, the only reason she really lived, so he, the individual backed over her and then pulled forward because so she got run over twice. And this was one of my, you know, it was one of my tougher calls. I mean, just in her situation, and you know, we got on scene. Had we had life light coming, and they were rendezvousing at the hospital with us because we were getting there quick so we'd get up to primary but she had petechiae i mean she had it, it was basically like strangulation her yeah. handlebars had wrapped around her and it's the only thing the tire ran over the handlebar and went back and it's wow. the only reason why she wasn't crushed but it busted her hip she had a collapsed lung when we were on her um and i was able to get a large wire i was able to get a 22 gauge in it right on scene and uh unfortunately a firefighter boot caught it and yanked it out Oh, shoot. And the whole way to the hospital, I had a hard time getting another line in. And uh, we uh, got to the hospital. The flight nurse got in, you know, and who I knew. And he's like, Frank, um, do you even have a line? I'm like, dude, I had one. It's gone. And we worked for a while, you know. And her dad got in and gave her a little, you know, said a prayer over. Mm -hmm. And as soon as he said, you know, bless those people's hands who are, helping my daughter yeah i got a flash you know and i and found a vein and i had tried everywhere and that iv stuck with her the whole surgery they were never able to get an iv and so that That's that call yeah. just with it just with everything that went on with that call she came back um it was my first uh news interview with channel four <laughs> we gave her a bike they came down had a big <laughs> deal about it you know and that was embarrassing dude <laughs> yeah, I'm not surprised she actually wanted to get back on a bicycle right. after that. And she did, you know, and the amazing thing is, is I see, I run into her at least once or twice a year. She's older now, you know, and she's doing great. And so those are, again, those are the rewards, you know, you have your calls yeah. that don't work out and those, I'm a crier, I'm a huge crier, <laughs> you know, even as a captain there, you know, I would go, especially after pediatrics and that was just my way. I, I had no issue climbing back in the rig or in the truck and just sitting there crying after everything settled down, you know, and it was always pediatrics. Adults, you know, you had those calls where uh, we had one single mom, just cardiac arrest, had no idea why. We worked her 30 minutes on scene, and as a captain, it was my job to go tell the 14- and 12-year-old, hey, we couldn't do yeah, much for your mom. And so you have those calls, job. you know, but you do your job. You do what yeah. has to be done, and you go back. Like I said, I, I'm a crier. So <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to be no. rude about it. I mean, so did that help? Was that was crying? that a coping mechanism that that you thought helped, like relieve some of the it did for me the emotion. Yeah, it did for me. You know, and then we had always, again, we'd always go back to the firehouse, and uh, after you know cleaning up and doing what needed to be done to be ready to respond again, we'd go sit around the kitchen table and we'd just talk about certain things, you know. And there was really only one call. I was able to meet with. A grievance counselor and it, and we had had a six month old who had tipped in its carrier and it hung itself by its by you know the throat the carrier was up on his cricut thyroid you know mm -hmm. <laughs> which if anybody knows what that is yeah but it, it yeah. hung itself and so we all you know with pediatrics like that they will compensate compensate and compensate but once they crash it's hard to get them back especially respiratory right right and so we uh on scene, you know, I was able to get an IO in him, and we worked that kid forever. And that 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 was hard for me. You know, that that was a hard call for me. I uh, I had to take a couple of days off on that one. I was upset with the caregiver. It's like, how can you do this? 
right. to a baby. That I, that I, was hard for me. That and I know the call you're talking about. Man, I believe that was hard for me. That was one of my hardest calls. And I remember, you know, in fact, we came. We we tied in with Saratoga, and we actually came down to your firehouse to have that grievance. Yeah. You know that 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 meeting, and uh, I I learned from there. You know, it wasn't so much about paying attention to the patient he lost. It was so much, it was those that had to live after, you right. know, and that, and right. that helped me a lot to be able to picture how that individual had to live with themselves. And that, that calmed me quite a bit because yeah. I mean, again, it's unfortunate. Those, those calls where individuals or pediatrics get left in cars and they die because you know, the physiology that yeah. they're going through in it. And yeah. that was hard for me. There was a lot of anger. <laughs> <at times. laughs> and so, you know, I just learned, uh, try and see it someone else's way. And I would just, uh, honestly, the crying released a lot and then sitting and talk about things. Yeah. You know, helped a lot. Yeah. I mean, life is, people get so busy and stuff like that and get distracted and forget about, right. It's a thing. It's they a sad can, deal. I think they forget about kids in the car. Right. I mean, that's why there's, uh, some cars that have a thing that says, check your back seat now. Right. Right. And just, right. I don't know if it's working or not, but <laughs> right. Uh, we don't, tend to go on too many of those uh, calls or kids are yeah. trapped in the car or locked in the car or forgotten in the car. Yeah. Thank goodness. But yeah, I think, um, you know, the audience probably could understand that, you know, pediatric pediatrics is a whole different world. It is. Than adult calls. Right. You know, right. everything's a lot smaller. Anatomy is different and right. it just, you know, the drug, drug dosages and everything has to be, you know, more spot right. on. So there's, there's a lot of things that play in pediatrics. And then, you know, the, the other part is, you know, difficult part for a lot of people is just those calls end up being at some point similar to that, you know, child that they have at home, you know, age or hair color and things like that. And that's, I see a lot of guys can go on a lot of pediatric calls. And then when they see one that resembles their kid in about same stages, that's, yeah, it makes it hard. That's when hard. things get really, yeah. really bad. And those calls can turn into the ones that, you know, that uh, turn into mental health issues long term. Right, right. That's true. That's true. And, I, yeah. and I'll tell you, it does affect you at home. You know, I mean, I think, you know, you and I have talked, you know, and, and I think uh, one of the one of the things that never really gets touched on so much is what you do with that home life. You know, you talk at the firehouse, but right. you have to go home. Right. And you just don't talk. <laughs> you don't talk at home. You yeah. know, you don't, they, they don't understand what you're going through. Yeah. Spouses, girlfriends, boyfriends, yeah. you know, husbands, they don't understand, you know. And so, especially with your kids, I mean, it was hard on me that they, they as, a, as a father of young kids, you know, it was hard on me. You know, I, I would go home, I'd see them do stupid stuff. You know, and I would be on their case <laughs> quick. And you have to, it, it's a hard adjustment. Yeah. It really is. So, yeah, that is, uh, I mean, you see what happens. You know, we only get called to the bad, the bad things generally. Right. And so when you see your kids making mistakes, it could similarly, you know, play down to that same road. Right. Yeah, it, uh, you, I think you relive that experience real quick and say, oh, I, I've seen that, where that leads to. You better right. knock it off. Right. And let's be honest, it probably doesn't come out very nice from <laughs> us. <laughs> right. It uh, comes out, you know, a little more it comes probably. Out a little sharper. Yeah, right. a little it bit sharper. It brings back those feelings. Yeah. You know, again, I mean, feelings are hard to, uh, y- you learn to suppress, but they sometimes they arise and, you know, and, and they're triggered by something. And you have to learn how to control those triggers and, and stop them so right. they don't arise. And so, you know. Uh, did you know you had any, did you develop any triggers during the time? Or did you, you, know, do you look back and see, uh, now I see him, but you didn't see him at the time? You know, yeah, they, just having kids was a trigger. <laughs> so, um, having kids is what trigger yeah, many things that, for everybody. Duh. Yeah. That's a big enough trigger for me. No, you know, it, again, it, as you mentioned, um, whether you recognize it or not, something of that call would trigger, you know, I, I mean, it's, I, I had responded so many times to kids being hit in parking lots. So as your kid sprints out the door, you know, and right. headed to the parking lot, you're yelling because yeah. I've been on that dead pediatric that got ran over and hit by a truck, right. you know, that you had no hope of saving. Um, God, a crazy thing. Even in, uh, 
we we went on a call where two brothers were chasing them you know a, a 10 and a, a 12 and a 10 year old were chasing each other through the house and their mom had put left the dishwasher open uh -huh. left the bottom drawer open <laughs> but the knives were facing up Oof. and they were steak knives and the brother pushed the other brother he went on and he had three knives that went up in him and so even even dumb things like that yeah. and you know i mean even i mean it, it, it's the the burn pans it's the scalding water right i mean i've scrubbed one of them one of the calls i went on was uh one of my best friends in the in the pd you know, with American Fork, and his little three-year-old daughter reached up, grabbed the pan handle, and mm -hmm. had sloughing by the time we got there yeah. on her face and everything. And, I mean, that was a hard call as well. So it's those triggers, and you right. you know, and sometimes you don't catch them. And yeah, so burn patients are some of those. They're hard. The just graphic right. scenes, they're just your body should not look like that. And you're just, right. when you get burned and your skin starts sloughing off, and it's just... It's just odd. I mean, I, I I don't really know how to explain it. You're just right. Sh layers of skin just grab when you touch them, just fall right off. Yeah, it's a sad thing. So yeah, that's a long, long, long recovery for those people that have been burned. Right. Did you ever felt like you got any training throughout your career uh, in mental health, like how to deal with calls? You know, no. I I, I to be straight up honest. I mean, you you departments always had processes in place after the fact. That's the problem. Right. It's always right. after the fact. Right. You know, it's as you stated. I mean, you don't really understand everything that's going on. I mean, after you start getting, you know, I remember when we first, you know, when I first started, the burnout phase was always 10 years. Yeah. And I never understood that because, I mean, God, I was the type, <laughs> I was the type of medic, the bloodier the better. That was yeah. just me. I mean, if you, if there was a rollover, on 15, you know, and I'm landing a bird, that's a good thing yeah. for me as a paramedic. That means I get to work. I get to right. do everything I've trained to do, right? Or if it's a good cardiac arrest, you know, you get to drop a tube in. That's just pushing drugs. I mean, that's what it was. Right. But then all of a sudden, down the road, that doesn't mean as much to you anymore. Yeah. And, and life starts catching up with you, I guess, you know? And so with that being said, um, I, you know, Again, departments have their processes in place to deal with that. And, you know, and they have their, their meetings that you can do, but I think it's caught way late down yeah. the road. It's not caught at the first. You know, I, I again, and I don't, it's, that's a double-edged sword because I think until you live that, you don't get it. You don't right. understand the importance. Right. But I still think there should be some education, a class put beforehand saying, hey, this is a great career choice, but here's what can happen. And I'll tell you, when people come up to me, I'm telling you, it's, I tell them it's a tough career. Yeah. You know, they, in the textbook, you know, they have, uh, you know, the well-being of the EMT right. or right. whatever. I'm like, ah. Uh. Personally, <laughs> I really don't think it, cut it cuts it. Like, right. it's not, I feel like you need somebody that's, you know, been through some things in life and can help you figure out a coping mechanism, you know, to take care of it in a healthy manner right. before you get into the field. Because once you're there and trauma starts happening and, you know, everything starts getting disrupted in your life from the, you know, the calls and it's, yeah, it's, it's too late. It is. Do, have you ever been to a critical like debriefing after that? Do you felt like it helped or, you know, again, we had that, that critical debriefing, you know, the group, what, what I was calling is a grievance meeting, you know, that, we after that six month old, you know, and the meeting was great, but it wasn't until I was able to sit one on one and just discuss my feelings, you know, and and it helped. As I said, it helped a lot, you yeah. know, and, and provided me with uh, some knowledge, some tr some, you know, just some tools to work with dealing with that. You know, again, yeah. it's, it's stopping thinking about how that. Persons that did live has to deal with it. Yeah. So sorry, I'm tapping. No, you can't. I have a bad habit of tapping. <laughs> I won't tap. But um, when it, you know, I think a lot of it, uh, you know, knowing, being able to see that, you know, I mean, but I had, there was so much built up before that call even happened. I mean, I had seen so many abused children. You know, I mean, yeah. I mean, it's a dark, it's a dark profession that we do. It really is. I mean, yeah. I, I, I mean, there was a six month old 
that I had gone on who basically, he just had croup. That's it. I mean, he's six months old. Mm-hmm. And uh, the new mom didn't know how to deal with it. She was, she was stressed out. And the new dad and baby wasn't sleeping. They were both wore out. <laughs> so she grabbed the car carrier and bashed his face in it. And that was hard for me. I yeah. mean, that I unfortunately got the nickname of Dr. Death that day yeah. <laughs> because I said my piece, you know, yeah. and I, I had to make sure that uh, the baby was okay. And I had to ask all the questions. And I asked the question of uh, if they had thrown the baby or shaken yeah. it and the husband got in my face, the cops pulled him off saying, Would, you know, my wife's not a monster. And it's yeah. like, well, I, and that, that was hard for me. Like I say, there's so many, so many calls we go on that, Finally, it just catches up with you. You know, I mean, there's there was just pediatric after pediatric that you know, and and that was that was hard for me because you know my theory, I guess a coping mechanism is adults <laughs> kind of deserve what they get because they're smart enough to get either they're either going to make the choice to do it or not. But kids, they usually pay a price for yeah. adults' choices. Yeah, and so you know, a lot of. I think a lot of EMTs, basic, advanced, paramedic, whatever level, they fear pediatrics. Pediatrics was always my favorite because I knew when you go on a pediatric, they had a legit call. Yeah. You know, they had a legit symptom. Yeah. And so, but that's, again, that's a double-edged sword because they're the hardest as well. Right, so. right. So was there, did you have some tipping points in your life when, you know, after seeing all that, did you have some things that maybe not go as you'd like? <laughs> yeah, right, <laughs> right. There's a reason there's a high divorce rate in, yeah. in our profession, right? Right. Um, yeah, I mean, again, there's just the way, even as a father, just the way, you know, I handled my own kids when they would do different things. Um, I, I got to a point where it was just, you know, I, thank goodness I always had ball. I played a lot of softball, and I yeah. had a lot of good friends. That was an out for me, you know, and then on top of that, I've also drummed professionally, so that was an out for me. So I had two outs that I could go and just get away and lose myself in, right? Right. And so, but but the downtimes, winters were always hard for me. Winters were always hard because there was nothing for me to do. I, was, I didn't ski, right? Yeah. And so I would sit home a lot, but it did. It bled into the way I fathered. You know, I had to go talk to, figure out how to stop that, you know, from jumping on, jumping on them. But I got yeah. to a point where... I just quit hanging out with even, even people. I right. mean, I would go to the firehouse, you know, and as a captain, they knew my door when it was shut at seven. Don't bother me unless it's a call. Yeah. And I did a lot of reading. I did a lot of reading, you know, and lost myself in a lot of reading, which helped quite a bit, you know, self-development books and stuff. And so, but it does, it bleeds in, you know, and affects how you treat people. I mean, I can't, yeah. I, got, I got to the point where if an adult got hurt, it's like, well, you're an idiot. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's your problem, not mine. So you lose your, but I would help. You lose your empathy over you time. You do, you do, you, you do. <laughs> I mean, yeah. and, and, and that was hard to gain back, to be honest. Yeah. It, it really was. Again, there's just so many things from, from domestic abuse to abuse to just, I mean, even, you know, I always, I was more empathetic in car accidents. You know, because it is what it is in, in, in any any motor vehicle accident. You know, I mean, you because they're just accidents. It yeah. wasn't yeah. Cu- on purpose, but the and abuse cases yeah, and different things like that. Yeah, my empathy was. <laughs> How'd you get it? Did, so did you realize that at the time? No, you don't. Not until you're down the road. You know, I remember, <laughs> I mean, again, I think I was five years in my career. And God, it was back. It was with the Olympics. You know, we had a guy coming on 15, and his girlfriend had just left him. And uh, he decided to build a pipe bomb. He was headed down to Seven Peaks, you know, where the ice hockey was being played. He was going to go bomb, do a pipe bomb down there. Had a suicide note in the back and everything. And he, uh, he, he, as he was driving down, decided it just wasn't worth it. He was going to go show his girlfriend how big of a man he was, right? And he chickened out, for lack of a better word. And tried to take his car off the freeway and during that he took a minivan with him that was full of two with twins that were a year and a half old thank goodness they were in their car seat you know but yeah. they they rolled we ended up flying both the twins and uh i took him right and he tried to plead his case with me and <laughs> it just did not go over well yeah. you know the cop we had i had an officer highway patrolman with me and he had showed me the note the pipe bomb and 
it just did not go over. You just don't have empathy for people like that, you know? And But you still do what needs to be done. Right. I mean, right. in the end, he's still your patient. You're your patient's advocate, and you yeah. do what needs to be done for him, you know? So, but sometimes just not as gentle. <laughs> it's, <laughs> well, you, you know, know? Emp- empathy is is really th- something I feel like that kind of comes and goes in, in waves in your career. It's, you know, depending on what's going on at home, what's going on at work, you know, right. everything plays into how I feel like empathetic you can be right to patients and, and burnout, you know, over, over time. And right. it's, it's, it's tough. I, I feel like it does this, you know, then you, you then you have some kind of check comes right. into your life, you know, and you need to check yourself and you're like, Oh yeah, this is right. I've got slid too far down this road. I'm not being, you know, right being empathetic like I should be to these, right. to these patients. And that's a great point, you know, and, and, and one of, the, one of the things that helped me the most to pull back out is to start giving back to the community. And it started creating, uh, you know, helping build the community emergency response team, cert teams uh-huh. and took over that program and, and got Eagle mountains program running pretty good, you know? And, uh, and then along with that was just teaching baby CPR, babysitting CPR. Uh-huh. And so by being able to do those different avenues, you know, and be able to give back to the community, you start getting, but that, again, that was 10 years down the yeah. road, you know, yeah. before they're just, I mean, we didn't even have cert teams when I started. Right. <laughs> but, you know, being able to give back helps quite a bit with, with that as well. So getting your, you being able to do these other things, you feel like it helps you get your right. your empathy back. Yeah, right. help build it back up. It does. So <clears throat> it are does. You, are you more empathetic now that you're not doing this job? Yes. <laughs> yes. There's not. There's not a doubt in my mind. Um, yeah, I can actually. Again, you just get. I mean, there's just so much. It's always back to back with everything. You don't have time to become empathetic. I guess uh, the term you don't have time to heal. You know. I mean, I would That's recommend. I would recommend to anybody to just go find a good therapist, sit down in between shifts or, you know, and, and go sit and open up. Um, do you, because you, know, you think people have enough courage to do that or, you or, know, or are there other, you know, is there a stigma to that? I, I don't know so much nowadays, you know, and there, I know when we were going through, sure. I mean, we were, you're expected to be tough. I yeah. mean, that is what it is, right? You didn't wear an SCBA for crying out freaking loud, you know, because it's just what you did. You just, the hot, it's whether you're on a wildland fire, a car fire, you know, but I think nowadays, again, you know, I, I, best thing I did was start seeing a trauma therapist, you know, and just talking about stuff and being able to understand, um, all the things I went through. You know, again, I think a lot of us don't, when you begin, you're so amped up to get out there and be the hero or whatever term you want to use, right? Yeah. Or do your job. Yeah. That you lose yourself. And and it, it got really easy to lose myself. I mean, I would pick up every shift I possibly could, <laughs> you know, especially as a volunteer. Like yeah. I say, there was a, there was a time, God, I think the highest, I went on 720 calls one year. And that was just in America, Fork City, because it was all volunteer. And I did yeah. everything I possibly could. Never was sleeping, you know, and I was just going at it. And I remember when I took the first response unit, which was the captain, we would be the first on scene. And then the, the medics would be coming in a rig, you know, the EMTs. And uh, they were always about five minutes behind. And my first call as, a, as the captain, um, a guy I had was coming up a guy and his girlfriend were coming up from California and he fell asleep and she was laying on his lap. And it's back when the gear shift was up by the steering wheel, not uh-huh. down, you yeah. know, and it was those rods that, that if the cap fell off, I mean, that's just a blown <laughs> object waiting to go into you. Yeah, right. Right. But he fell asleep and went off the entrance ramp and jumped the entrance ramp and buried himself and her and uh, God, they had to be going at least 85 and buried themselves in the center block building. So now we've compromised the building and I'm on scene. She can't breathe. Yeah. You know, and I can't even get to her because they didn't have an airbag. God, I think it was a 77, you know, Oldsmobile or whatever. One of the big, you know I mean? Back in the, when we built That's, tanks, right? Right. That's and it. the engine block was pushed all the way up into him. And, and I'll tell you, that was when we lost her. You know, she had she had a traumatic tamponade to where once we released her, you know, um, 
she shot, she just died right there. There's nothing you can do for that. You know, we, we got her in the bird, the bird was off the ground and she died on the way he lived. He lived because she was his airbag. And yeah. so that weighed on me. In fact, I actually went to the, to the pound and looked at that car for a bit, you know? And so again, it's those calls that just, I mean, I can see that whole thing. I can see her legs, but the way they were bent, you know, the gear shift went into her. So, you know, I can still see it like it, like it just happened. God, that was 25 yeah. years ago, you know, the and ones, the ones that stay with you, yeah. you, can, yeah. you can definitely remember. Right. And so, you know, if I would have, I wish I would have known back then to answer your question. I wish I would have known back then the importance of opening up and having a therapist to go to. And that's why I say I would, you know, departments, cities, however you want, you know, that. They're all ran by budgets, and they only have so much budget to spend. Right. Right. And so sometimes you have to take it upon yourself to go heal. Yeah. You know, and, and that's what insurance is for. But I'll tell you, it's dang, it's it's well worth going and healing. Yeah. So. It, I, I would agree that I have, you know, I've found my own way to, to deal, with, deal with things. Um, I personally haven't been to a, a therapist right. um, for, for that, uh, right. you know. Right. One, one time I got a divorce, so I went to. <laughs> <laughs> there was just one went, time yeah, at band camp. <laughs> yeah, I went to, so I went to a therapist, you know, for that type of stuff. But, I'd, you know, it's it's been a lot of like you know you said I read self you know development books, and that's really where I have found a lot of you know ways to help myself deal with what we have to see and what we go through, and you know some other things where I I gave up working the two, three, four, or five jobs at one point. I had five yeah. jobs at one time. And that's been, that's been huge because, I mean, you're, sure, you're putting yourself through seeing more and more stuff all the time, but as you get tired, right. things f affect you quite differently. And I was actually um, doing some work because I'm uh, preparing for a class to teach, but on sleep. And it's statistics with sleep and uh, trauma, yeah. you know, how we deal with things but you know the trauma that we see is huge right our our sleep is like the thing in our lives that like it's the main pillar right. honestly right we always think you know mind body soul spirit you know all those right. types of the pillars of life and they are pillars but without that sleep you know you, you we don't have time to heal from any anything right. both physical or mental right and they're finding that uh the lack of sleep is actually, you know, starting to correlate with men a lot of mental illnesses. Right. So it's just like, I, I can't, can't wait to share the statistics on that, but it's, right. it's pretty amazing. And yeah. we, we suck at sleep as first oh, we, responders. Horrible. Horrible. You it's know, always I, interrupted. Yeah. So, I, you know, being a, being a firefighter, you know, depending on the station you work at, you know, how many times you get up at night. And, you know, and if you're a police officer or whatever, right. working shift work, right. that is just not good for your body. Right. I mean, right. th there's, you know, there's, there's so many reasons. And I, I, for those police officers out there that are doing, you know, the different yep. shift work, I feel terrible for them, you know, how it's, how impactful it is for well, their lives. They also have at least two jobs. Minimum. Yeah. And so again, they, even when their day's off, they, they aren't sleeping. So yeah. yeah. Yeah, you're and right. Then, yeah, and it's you know military too, same yep. thing. Everybody's, yep. you know, it's just not a good, a good system that we're we're working in right. as far as environment with when it comes to sleep. Right. So, as emergency as of the emergency, uh, gosh, now I can't even talk. <laughs> in your federal position as emergency manager, manager, emergency manager, did how did that play out in your life? Because yeah, I feel like you went through this, you know, maybe kind of a traumatic period of being a paramedic and right. stuff and being real active, and now you're being an emergency manager. Right. You know, they. I'm grateful for being a firefighter paramedic. I mean, you, you, there's just so many things you take away from it. You know, as tough as it is, you you grow. And, and being able to manage calls, you know, understanding – I always call it controlled chaos on scene. I mean, there's times you can show up, you got one patient, times you got 20 patients, you yeah. know. And so that helped me quite a bit, you know. And during the transition, um, honestly, 
the driver was money. I mean, I, I doubled my salary and then I didn't have to work any nights as yeah. well. So, I mean, that was a driver at first, right? Right. But my, you know, I, I always felt like I had hit my ceiling in the fire service and there was not more that I could do. There wasn't much more I could go. I mean, I, you know, I mean, I even becoming a critical care paramedic or a flight paramedic, you know, I, I played and toyed around with and had an opportunity to go as a tactical paramedic and join the Utah County SWAT team. And as I weighed out odds, this position opened up, you know, as a federal contractor with URS that as an emergency manager. I mean, as I looked at it, um, it was a good, it was a good change. You know, we, it, it, I had a hard time always being reactive and that's what we are. We always reacted right. to the incident. You know, we try to do some preparation, right? We'd always try to do preparation with training. Uh, right. Well, <laughs> so. and I, well, yeah. And yeah, I mean, you could, you can teach all the CPR courses you want, but accidents are going to happen, you know, and speed, especially the speeds nowadays, you know, I mean, again, you, no matter what you did to try and teach people the safety of, or what not to do, um, they still did it. I mean, I couldn't, I, I couldn't it's tell free you agency. Many, right. Right. <laughs> I couldn't tell you how many motorbikes I went on that didn't have helmets and they died. Yeah. Long story short, you know, whether they didn't, whether leathers or, and when you came across somebody with leathers, you respected that. It's like, Hey, this guy's <laughs> smart. I'm going to do everything I can to save your leathers. Yeah. Right. And they thanked you very much so, but you know, so in that transition, what, what I really loved with emergency management was being proactive. You know, I mean, I worked with a decon team, hazmat team, high angle rescue um, teams, and as well as the paramedics and being able to write plans. And, and, you know, I had some great opportunities. We were out there um, right after 9-11. So, you know, I got, there's nothing, when you're on an army installation, you get good training because yeah. it's an expectation. Um I remember when the active shooter first came out and that was when uh, the incident at Fort Hood took place. And we, I had the opportunity to sit with colonels and everybody and get firsthand active shooter training, you know, and that, and it was shortly after FEMA hurrying threw out a plan. And then I had to learn to uh, reconstruct that plan to fit our site. So, you know, that, that was a better driver for me because I felt like I was teaching people, Hey, here, you know, bomb threats, I mean, simple things, you know, of uh, that everybody on sites deal with from hostile environments. But I also got to be able to teach special response teams to deal with the hostage negotiation exercise, you know, uh, and terrorist attacks and stuff. And so that, again, that became where I could be more proactive instead of being reactive. Hey, here's situations you can that you're going to face and that that helped quite a bit you know i mean i enjoyed doing that i i i had responded enough <laughs> you know someone <laughs> now, now, you, now you want to make the plan yeah so is that healing you think maybe too? it was maybe? for me it was for me you know um it was it allowed again you to be able to pass on experiences that i gone through you know to first responders out there we we uh had first responders that we'd go through and I would come in and run their exercises for them and run mass casualty incidents for them. It's a final, a drill, but you know, being able to work with them and just teaching them, you know, even, even community emergency response teams. I, I remember I got to teach the psychology part of that course. And a lot of people, you know, they, they're excited, but when you start telling them that most of the people you're going to respond on are your neighbors and your friends that you see every day. Yeah. And some of them might not be alive. You know, then it starts setting in. Right. I don't think they and thought so, about that. No, nope, they don't. And that's, you know, so when you say healing, you're able to pass on everything that I guess, you know, brought you down and pass that on and say, hey, here's some of the things you could see. And you can mentally prepare them versus all of a sudden they're showing up and it's their best friend dead. Yeah. So, yeah. So going through a process with them to, to prepare them, I like that. That's, right. And it's, you know, and that's actually a, a, probably a great healing process for you to be able to look back. This is what I went through. This is what I did. This is what happened. And now I can pass something better forward from, right. what, from what you've learned. Right. So it was good. So what's your, what's your plans now in life? Um, I don't know. I'm still <laughs> yeah. It's all up in the air. Um, I don't know. There's, again, you know, I'm toying with the idea of getting, getting back out 
putting together courses to help people. There's a lot that's changed in our world since we first started doing right. it. You know, I mean, there's, there's more shootings. I enjoy, you know, I had the opportunity to be with a uh, special team that studied Columbine when Columbine came through, you know, and that was a huge changer for all the schools, you know, and I've been able to go and, and work with some of the schools and, and, you know, law enforcement has completely changed their game of how they respond yeah. to shooters and stuff. They continue you know? to. Yep. And, and, and it's ongoing. And so if I can tap in somehow and, and not so much work with law enforcement cause they know, they know their job, Yeah, but it's going in and working with businesses and being able to say, Hey, if there's a shooter, this is what you do. Because again, I come to the point, no one, our society or people, and we we know this, be, you know, because we deal with it in our career. They don't ever think it's going to happen to them. It's not if it's going to happen; it's when it's going to happen. Something will happen yeah. to you at some yeah. point. You need to be prepared. And if you, you know, if going in and being able to teach people, people freeze. You know, there's a reason shooters get as many targets as they do because people freeze. They never put a plan together. You know, they don't know what the heck to do. They yeah. don't know. I mean, they might hear a shot and run, but at times they run to the shot. So if you can give the simple steps to them and say, Hey, here's what you can do, or let's talk something simpler, cardiac arrest, by all means get 911 coming, but start pumping. Yeah. Right. Get things, that blood things, up to the right. things to do in the meantime right. before other first responders. Right. And I'll tell you more arrive. knowledge. If I, if there's anything I learned as an emergency manager, the more knowledge that people have, it suppresses a lot of fear and then they respond correctly. You know, and so our first first responder classes, I mean, there was uh, the kids that I taught or the, the employees that I taught, they never used their first responder on our site. We had scrud. We went over, oh, heaven, 17 million man hours without any incidents. That's pretty impressive. We oh, it's it, it was a goal. It was we owned records right through OSHA. But I had one first responder save a drowning patient, a kid at a lake. They were out there on the 4th of July. He dove in and started CPR on the kid, saved him. I had several out on the road on rollovers that would stop um, and had several saves that way. You know, it's that it's that knowledge and the tools that you can pass on that, you know, then it, it's a ripple effect. Then they help someone and then they help someone, you know. And so there was several calls where... Um, our first responders. And I'll tell you, the one thing about our senior management is they recognized him. Galvey had given $500, you know, saying thank you yeah. for, for owning this, you know. And so I would try to go out and push people over just to help them, but they never, <laughs> they never bought it. <laughs> so. That's very cool for a company to, to do that. It is. Do you think there's a lack of that uh, in society now, that there we're not planning for things like that? I mean, there are, of course, you know, on the professional side of things of police, fire, military, and, you know, different things like that are planning, but you think general businesses are just don't well plan for things? I do. My, you know, my thinking is, and, and I've worked with some of the big, you know, some big companies, but the thing is, is they're, they're there to make money. They have a job to do. Everything else is just secondary. And so when you start pointing out the secondaries, then they realize how important it is. You know, I had an opportunity to work with a company. They had a tower, a, a mine tower, right? Or a, my, they had a mine shaft. And the belt would go up to, oh, I think it was 250 feet tall. Yeah. And they had a man up there. Well, the guy is the oldest employee they have. And I finally said, what are you going to do if that guy has a heart attack? How are you getting him down? Yeah. And that was when they realized that we need a plan. And so I wrote a plan for him. And we actually went out and trained how to get that guy down. Um, they, bought a, they bought a CPR adjunct board, you know, and kept it for that reason and they stored it up there so and we worked with high angle rescue teams they created a high angle rescue team i had some people go down and work with them and teach them systems and how to get that guy down quicker because other than that they're going down just that ladder with that cage and that does not work very well. <laughs> and so you know i think a lot of businesses they focus on what they're there to, to do you know whether it's a dental office whether it's a gym whatever you know they have why they're you know their business. In business for that, yeah. and everything else is secondary. But once you introduce that secondary, I mean, it's it, an example. You know, I was I was at a gym, and they have a kid care right. And I asked them, I said, "What are you going to do if someone walks in here with a gun? What do you What are your plans for that kid?" Because I'm always thinking, "That's yeah. just me." It's not that I'm coming <laughs> in with a gun, but it's just what I'm programmed to do, right? right? And they didn't know. 
And I'm like, you know, you have an exit out the back. Don't you think it would be best to run the kids out there if someone's coming in the front? I said, you guys need to have your employees trained. And that's when they finally said, we do. And I sat down with that whole group one day in their break room and we talked about it. And we put a plan together, you know. So does that gym, they own many, many gyms and they all have kid cares. And we all know, you know, I mean, it's good whether they're roiding or not. Something, there's always a potential something can happen. Yeah. Anywhere. You know, I mean, who would have thought that some guy was going to show up at Colorado and start shooting at a movie theater? Right. You know, and that's the thing. We always re- we're re- we are reactive. We're not a proactive society. We're reactive. And when that happened, all of a sudden, everybody thought, well, what do we do? You know, and then again, we never thought it would happen here till Trolley Square. Think about that. Yeah. You know, I mean, you hear about the Texas Bell Tower shooting and oh, it can never happen in Utah. And then all of a sudden, Trolley Square happened. Yeah. And thank goodness the off-duty cop knew what to do. Because other than that, that guy would have had more targets to hit. So I don't think businesses and I don't think people really realize the threat that's out there. Sorry, that was a long answer no, to your question. No, no, I, 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 I like that. I, I think that would be a, it's a good niche to, to get out there and educate people. And right. it's not just about what's going to save them out their business, but what could be you know helpful to them when there are other places. Right. So you know, they can use those skills anywhere, not just in that business, I think is the great thing when you're training people right, or things like that. Right. Well, you know, I, I, I'm interrupting you. I'm hijacking this conversation. No, you're good. But, you know, about. a lot of people don't talk about talk to their kids. And I'll, and I'll be honest. I, I'm straight up honest with my kids. They understand. If we go to a movie, hey, where's your two exits? Which way are you going to go? If I go down, what are you going to do? You know, I mean, I've got a six-year-old daughter. Their, her brother's no how to get her out, you know, if we go to Walmart or we go Target or go anywhere, any shopping, how are you going to get out? What are you going to do? If you're at school and I'm not there, my 10 year old knows how to get my six year old out. If they're out on the playground and some kid decides to start shooting, I mean, heavens, we have 11 year olds taking yeah. high powered rifles yeah. to school. Doesn't you matter bet. in age. You Doesn't bet. matter. Not anymore. And so I think a lot, even at home, I think again, as a society, we stay quiet because we, we don't want to put fear in our kids, but, and then we're setting them up for failure. And that, that, that is a pet peeve. I'll be honest. It drives me insane that we just sit on our hands instead of educating. Because if you educate, then you have the knowledge how to respond and you don't freeze. So, yeah. sorry. Hi, hi. No, it makes a lot of sense. It makes a lot of sense to me. Something a lot of people probably need to consider and stuff. You know, I've had some decent amount of police training and tactic training and stuff like that. But, yeah, I'm always, I'm always on guard, right. you know looking over your shoulder, what's around and exits and where you're sitting and all kinds of stuff. Yeah. It's, it's important because I want to be able to respond if I, if I need to. Right. Any regrets being a first responder? None. No, I'd do it all over again. I would just do different. I I, I would change (laughs) things obviously. Right. No, I mean, again, it's, it's a, you meet some great people. You know, I mean, I've got some really, really good stories. Sure, you live with some hard stuff. And if you can figure out how to live with that darkness, you know, um, there's a lot of good things you do. You know, there's a lot of a lot of good people you meet, a lot of good people you work with. Um, and, again, I, I can tell you as many positive stories, you know, as I can dark stories. So that's good. It is good. There's, you have to learn that balance, <laughs> right? So I, I generally forget a lot of the calls. Actually, I feel pretty. I mean, in general, but they're right. still the ones that you just never ever forget, right? And this right. is, uh, yeah, thirty years for me. Yeah, still remember some of the first ones, <laughs> right? So, so, um, what's your greatest accomplishment <laughs> as a first resp- being a first responder? Oh, uh, my greatest accomplishment. Um, I don't know that, you know, I had, I had the opportunity to mentor. I had the opportunity first to be mentored by, by a pretty good deputy chief. And when I, I became a captain at 27 and I got called in his office and he shared with me, he goes, you were always training those below you to take your job. And I thought, well, I don't want them to have my freaking job, <laughs> yeah. right? You know, I mean, you actually think, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's like, no, yeah. because they just tested for it. And I just beat them. Right. I mean, you know how, yeah. everybody's always trying to claim that ladder. <laughs> but I took that to heart. And, uh, you know, I was able to um, lead, for lack of a better term, you know, train, whatever term you want to use, 
a lot of firefighters. And to see where they are now, I mean, one of them is a fire marshal at BYU. The other is an emergency manager at BYU. I've got some that have gone in, you know, that trained under me and that have gone on to be captains in other departments. You know, there's one up in so South Jordan, up in, you know, up there is a captain. And so, you know, it's not so much about me. It's what you pass on. You know, my greatest accomplishment would just be lessons that I learned in helping. I mean, I, I, I had one firefighter who, uh, he was done. I mean, he turned to alcohol. His wife uh, had left him, and he went down a deep, dark hole. And to be able to sit with him and work with him and just open up and bring him back, and he went on to be a captain. You know, I mean, those it, it's those things. You know, it's being able to pass on or just see where people went that were underneath you. I, don't, I mean, scrud, sure, did I have saves and did I have cool calls? Yeah. yeah. Oh, well. You know, but it, it's passing on lessons you learn. It's being able to sit down and listen. You know, it's the friendships you make. That's probably the greatest accomplishment of my career, I guess. Yeah. You know, that's, those are great. Those are great. It's, <laughs> so, it's all about the people. Right. right. Yeah. I mean, that's what you have to do as a, as a leader, train people to take your, take your job. Right. And yeah, they'll get their, they'll get their chance either to take it from you or, uh, you know, get, get promoted when, <laughs> when the testing comes <laughs> and do an it. awesome job. So, right. If you've, if you trained them well, what do you want people to hear from you? What's your message? <laughs> What's my message? Um, Any, or advice? What's, you know, I, I, I would, again, just, to just emphasize, um, man, don't, don't ever hold back from preparing for it. I mean, it's not, again, we, there's a reason terrorists are successful because everybody thinks it's not going to happen to them. So if there was anything out of any of this to take is just prepare yourself, know that it's going to happen, prepare for it and know what you're going to do. You know, I mean, that's, that's the most important thing, whether it's, you need to, you feel like you need to go learn CPR by all means, at some point, somebody's going to fall dead in front of you, yeah. you know, um, thank goodness AEDs are everywhere nowadays, you know, and, and as, as you know, and, you know, as anybody that is a first responder, the two most important things with the cardiac arrest are electricity and drugs. And you have the, any, anybody, any lay person has the opportunity to put electricity on, yeah. you know, with the AEDs. So if there was ever a takeaway, just go prepare yourself, you know, go get some extra tools, learn how to help a choking victim, learn how to respond. If all of a sudden there's a shooter, talk to your freaking kids, educate them so they know what the hell to do. If something happens and they don't freeze, because I can tell you, I've been with parents who didn't teach their kids and I've watched them grieve and I watched them if I would have only done this. And that's not a good life. That's not a good life. It's a, it's a very toxic, corrosive life. So get out there, quit being afraid. I think we get suppressed by fear too much. What you do you know? mean? What do you mean by that? Suppressed to try new things or yeah, just, just get out there. Who cares? Make a fool out of yourself. Right. I mean, who cares? I just, <laughs> my, you know, I learned a long time ago. I just, I would rather be, I'd rather make a fool out of myself learning something and say, hey, I don't know what I'm doing and learn it and have that extra tool than sit there and say, I can't do this. That's just me. So I like it. I like it. I like it. getting out of your comfort zone to learn new things all the time is, is man. Yeah, it's like Great showing up here doing a podcast <laughs> and you saying, "Hey, we're going live yeah, on IG." Yeah, hey, yeah. What's and up? We, we, oh, and then look, and, <laughs> then, it, and then it disconnects, and then right. it reconnects, and then and then now it decides to shut down. Uh, so we yeah. have thirty viewers. Yeah, yeah. So, Set a record. Right, right. So trying new things, and sometimes you know, it's, uh, we tried this and it uh, worked out okay. We're great after some technical issues but hey <laughs> <laughs> well thanks Jeff I yeah. uh, appreciate you being on alright alright thanks Sounds Jeff good. thanks man yeah. thank you for listening to episode 12 of him during the badge podcast Jeff was a great guest and I hope he got some good things out of that and it must be very rewarding to go from being reactive to proactive and also taking that into your personal life not just into your career I want this podcast to be impactful for both you, the listener, and your friends and family. Life changing. So if you know somebody that would be great on this podcast, please email me at jlund at fireandfuelpanel.com and we'll see if we can get them on there. Once again, like, share, and comment on these podcasts. This is for you, and I want to hear your stories. 